Sometimes life happens. We see you. And you feel all alone. We feel you. With nowhere to go. We got you. So many questions unanswered. We understand. Yeah. And you feel like you can't. That's right. But God rest understands. with your own thoughts. Uh, uh. This is for you. Yeah. When life happens and it makes Come. you feel like you are. You're off the beat. Off, off the beat. Off the beat. Off, off the beat. Off the beat. Off, off the beat. Real authentic conversations. Conversation. Read and introduce um, who she is, and uh, so her name is Tabitha Garcia, and she runs her own practice out of there, out of uh, Beaumont, California. That's there in Riverside County, um, near LA area. For everyone that's not familiar with the IE, <laughs> um, and she has a practice called Bienestar Counseling. And uh, Tabitha Garcia, she has a passion for working with Latinx folks, BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, and people of color and those with intersecting identities. She is a child of immigrants, a first generation Latina, and a licensed marriage and family therapist who is passionate about helping individuals gain clarity and find peace in their authenticity. Tabitha also supports individuals who have embarked on journeys of religious deconstructing. She utilizes an interactive and collaborative approach of evidence-based modalities and wellness practices based on her clients needs and some of her specialties are general mental health anxiety and panic disorders depression personal growth and self-esteem general relationship challenges that come between family friends and even co-workers so with any further ado welcome tabitha garcia yes thank you thank you for having me welcome 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 to offbeat podcast man and uh we're excited to have you here i'm excited to have you here and i'm uh joined by my lovely co-host and wife hi yes thank you for being here and i'm excited to be on here too i'm usually like i was saying earlier i'm usually behind the camera but today i'm with you guys so i'm excited to be here yeah yeah so and yeah so it, it's the first time that i get to get have my wife on uh, on the show with me and so that's that's exciting. It's going to be interesting yeah. if this turns into a, a therapy session. <laughs> We're here for it. <laughs> that's why we brought uh, Tabitha here. No, no, I'm joking, guys. But yeah, it's um, we're really excited because when I started, um, you know, along with uh, my buddies, when we started, uh, when we embarked on this journey of um, Offbeat Podcast, you know, that was one of the things that that we really wanted to target i guess you could say you know was mental health you know and and that's kind of even why we uh um you know came up with the name offbeat Mm -hmm. offbeat podcast you know and and i even talk about it on um uh one of our pilot episodes that we still haven't released yet but we kind of dove into you know what mental health looked like in our lives Mm -hmm. you know what it um you know challenges that we faced and things like that and um, but I was like, you know, I want to bring a professional. Yeah. I want to bring someone that has the experience that, um, you know, is working with individuals mm-hmm. towards getting better and, um, you know, to really shine perspective and not just shine, you know, perspective on this matter, but even to provide some tools, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm so excited. And uh, Tabitha, why don't you just um, tell us a little bit about tell our audience a little bit about yourself, mm-hmm. where you come from, where'd you grow up? Yeah. So uh, nice to meet everyone. Thank you for inviting me on your podcast. I'm excited to be here. Um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I was born and raised in the Inland Empire. Um, I went to high school out here, went to college out here. My grad program was out here. So I'm a very proud Inland Empire uh, (laughs) native. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I graduated from Cal State San Bernardino with my bachelor's in uh, psychology. And also uh, for my grad program, I went to Cal Baptist University. Nice. And so I graduated with my master's there in counseling psychology. So that's uh, a little bit about my education. But 
Um, you know, I've, I've worked in the field of mental health for about 10 plus years now, but I've been a therapist for seven years. Okay. Yes. Um, so I've seen, uh, you know, I've worked in a variety of settings, so I've seen all kinds of things, really. Yeah. I've worked in hospitals, so I've worked in like psychiatric units. I've worked in detention, so in jails. Nice. Um, I've worked with families, I've worked with children, um, but ultimately I came to learn that my passion was really working with adults, young adults uh, who are Latino, who uh, are BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color, um, you know, and just the challenges that we face, uh, yeah. you know, as people with these identities, um, because that's the truth. We do. We face special challenges uh, yeah. living within the society. So that's really where my passion lies. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, what any challenges that when you were growing up, where are your parents from, first of all? Like where? Yeah. So my parents are from Mexico. Okay. Uh, my dad is from El DF and my mom is from Morelos. Okay. Yeah. But uh, most of my family migrated here to the U.S. and they pretty much reside here in the Inland Empire. Okay. Yeah. So All my right. parents are here. My grandparents are here. Yeah. Everyone's here. Okay. Nice. Nice. Have you ever visited Mexico? I have. Okay. Yes. Nice. Yeah. So you've gone to El DF? I've gone to El DF more when I was younger. I go to me uh, Mexico now, like for vacations. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're going for, you know, Cabo's one of our favorite places to go. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And so growing up, growing up uh, Latina, first generation, Mexican, American, you know, what, what challenges do you recall facing? Mm hmm. Well, uh, just to add a little twist to that too, right? Uh, I also grew up uh, as a pastor's kid. Oh, so wow. my parents were pastors uh, when, when I was younger. Um, and being a Latina, being a pastor's kid, you know, being a person of color, um, being a, a child of immigrant, right? Yeah. Um, there, you know, were challenges such as like just navigating school systems, mm -hmm. right? Navigating... Uh, just friendships, you know, yeah. trying to figure out like what circle you fit in, yeah. right? Do you fit in with the Latinos? Like, do you fit in with this population, with that population? Like, yeah. where do you fit in? Yeah. Um, especially as someone who is bilingual, but Spanish is my second language, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, navigating like the systems within the church, you know, like yeah. your place even within the family, like, you know, what is your role as the eldest, the, you know, another identity, right? Yeah. Like, what is your role as the eldest? What, uh, yeah, like, what are you fulfilling even within the family, you yeah. know? So yeah. those are some challenges that I personally faced. Um, yeah, and that really led me to seeking out, you know, wanting to just connect with other people who are also, uh, you know, finding challenges within within these identities. Yeah, yeah. So that I, I know that you can relate to that. Yes, <laughs> I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, because I'm actually a PK as well, uh -huh. and um, I can relate. I always. Thinking about my childhood, like right now that you're talking about mm -hmm. that, like what circle you fit in, even the peer pressures of mm -hmm. sometimes those circles can cause. Mm -hmm. I think it would, for me, I guess it was a little difficult, I guess. I mean, it was, it wasn't as difficult because I kind of had my solid rock. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I knew where I stood. Mm -hmm. I knew how far I can go and how far I couldn't go. I think because I'm actually the youngest. Mm -hmm. So I kind of learned I would learn from my brother's and my sister's mistakes, you know, so that kind of mm -hmm. helped me, I guess, like, okay, don't do this, you know, and I think I've always had, I've always told my husband this, this is something that I've always had behind my back because I grew up in the church. I just wanted to please God. I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure I'm always pleasing God, mm -hmm. you know, and so even in high school, like where the peer pressure is at, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. where there's so many circles that you can get involved to, but it's so funny. I would have my circle of friends. They're really cool girls. You know, they weren't no popular girls. We we're just kind of like the mid, you know, mm -hmm. but I was, I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't need to be with no, you know, I liked where I was at mm -hmm. because then they knew to where I was, you know, they knew that I was actually a pastor's kid. I, t I would tell them, I would tell them I would go to church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had the, we had to go to, um, you know, get the young adult ministry service, you know, and 
I would go and things like that. Like, no, I can't go. I can't go to your guys' party because I have this. Right. <laughs> I have <Yeah>. church. <laughs> right. You know, like, oh, okay. Like, oh, like, that's sad. You know, I'm like, yeah, but it's okay. Like, I'm good. I'm good. I was good. You mm-hmm. know, I was very happy where I was at. I just think, like, a lot of it was just more like my parents just not understanding sometimes, sometimes how difficult, mm-hmm. like, because of where they came from, because they're immigrants too. Mm-hmm. My parents are from Guanajuato, and um, so they have a traditional bring up, that traditional bring up, and sometimes they just didn't know how to navigate us here in the US. Like today, mm-hmm. like with the culture here. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why, like, um, it, I can, I can, um, sympathize and empathize even like with what you're saying because because you know like with her it was like she was the youngest so her parents probably learned a lot you know from her older brothers as well as far as nurturing and things like that but like on your your side of the spectrum like I can almost see like how difficult that could have been navigating through school navigating through you know different things because I remember growing up, you know, in those situations where like, who am I, you know, who do I fit in with? Mm -hmm. But then you all, but then also having that, you know, that church background, (laughs) you know, like, cause that's just another, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know if it sounds bad, but like another baggage or another label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like another label added to you where it's like, okay, like, yeah, (laughs) you can't hang out with these people cause you're this, you can't go here cause you're this, you can't do this. Well, and then if you, when you do choose a circle that you feel comfortable with, like how far can you go? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. What are the limitations to that? Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. I, I relate to your story a lot, you know, just uh, the expectations. When you said label, I was like, oh, yeah. these are the expectations as a pastor's child. Mm. Like who, yes, you have to find the circle uh, of friends who, uh, you relate to, but like you also have to watch what you're doing because yeah. you're a pastor's kid. <laughs> you're being watched, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, yes. One thing that I remember t- that was told to me often is, Tu eres el ejemplo. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the example. You're setting the example for everyone. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Just, yeah. Just the example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything rises and falls on you. So, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, you know, how much. The freedom does one have with yeah. that expectation you yeah. know like how much can you really explore who you are uh at your core yeah. you know with that expectation so yeah. it was it was a difficult uh a difficult thing to navigate you know yeah. to really find your identity um when you're being the ejemplo for everyone yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that's and um and i remember when i first because i came in I came into the church. I got saved when I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. No upbringing, no church background, nothing, nothing. You know, very, I think the most religious experience I ever had before that was probably every time I would pass by a church, Mm -hmm. you know, me persinaba, boom, boom. (laughs) You know, that was like, that was as far as my religiousness went, you know, and it was just out of habit. But when I came in, like at first, I, um, I came in and I, at that time we had a lot of church kids, Mm -hmm. a lot. I remember And um, in the beginning, it was very hard because I was brought up different. Mm -hmm. So it was very hard to understand them. You know, I Mm -hmm. couldn't understand Mm -hmm. because, you know, I almost in a way, you know, I I know I judge them. Mm -hmm. Like I judge them because I said, well, man, you know, I can understand why I am the way that I am. Why Mm -hmm. are they the way that they are? Mm -hmm. You know, and it it took me, you know, it took me a a couple months, even I want to say a couple years to really understand that, man, you know what the um, what? Uh, a child you know that's brought up you know what I mean um, as many benefits as they do have as many privileges as they people might think they have but you know if we're establishing right now is that they also go through a lot of identity challenges mm-hmm. a lot because like you said I, I like what you said right now it's hard for them to really um, discover who they are at the core mm-hmm. because of sometimes because of the limitations and then and do you think that those limitations, I think you guys kind of mentioned it a little bit, but also have to do with our cultural limitations, right? That our parents, yeah, would you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I touched a little bit on like the role of the eldest, right? Like being a child of immigrants mm-hmm. uh, and being the eldest, like 
what responsibilities fall on the eldest, right? Yeah. You're you're essentially becoming another parent <laughs> in within the household, yeah. right? You're taking care of the siblings, you know. Um, you may have some household responsibilities that don't go, you know, to your other uh, to the other siblings, yeah, um, to the other children in the home. So yes, culture uh, definitely plays, you know, a huge part in in identity as well, yeah. you know, and who you who you uh, learn to believe that you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome, awesome. I'll I'll piggyback. Well, I'm the youngest, so I know like, well, I did get responsibility, <laughs> you know, like I think because my my brothers. Well, they really, really do much when they're, <laughs> you know. Like, so it was more on the girls, I guess, to help out in the home, you know. Mm-hmm. So my mom really taught us that. But I think what, but I did want to, I don't know, I was just thinking, like, what can I say about that, like, the cultural differences, even about just the responsibility. So what I'm thinking is what happened to me at, to a certain point in my life mm-hmm. already when I was, like, 19 years old, I, had, I made a big decision in my life. Mm-hmm. And when I made that decision, and that's actually because when I I actually got with my husband, we don't have the greatest story, love story, how we got together. You know, it wasn't perfect, you know? So when I made that decision to be with my husband, like I saw how much everybody had me on a pedestal Mm -hmm. as the youngest and as the one that would actually was the obedient one Mm -hmm. in the home, Mm -hmm. you know, was the obedient one even at church. Mm -hmm. I was involved in everything. Like I was involved in worship. I was involved in the youth ministry. Like I was there. Like mm-hmm. you can count on me type thing. I was the one there in the be- and you know I was early. I was late. Like because I was helping because I love to serve God. Mm-hmm. You know. But when I finally made a decision because it's what my heart wanted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was it's what my heart wanted. You know. Um, I just saw how much. My parents put me on a pedestal because they're very, you know, they weren't happy with my decision. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people weren't happy with my decision. A lot of people got hurt. But at that point, I was just like, I was like, wow, like I got to really like see what it is, like how it feels when you make like a big, you know, I guess I wouldn't say for me, it wasn't a mistake because it's something that I, you know, I wanted to do. But it was a mistake in other people's eyes, mm-hmm. you know. So that judgment, that condemnation, yeah. you know how how it felt. Because I never felt that. Mm-hmm. I never yeah. felt that, you know, until then. Mm-hmm. And it's taught me a lot. It's made me stronger, mm-hmm. I believe, to where I am today. And um, but I just see how the traditional, how sometimes just the traditional religious things can really hold one like. Because it took a while, it took a while to get, you know, forgiveness to come in place Mm -hmm. with my family, to really like even acceptance, Mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, we were, we stayed together (laughs) through the obstacles, through the trauma, I guess you could Mm -hmm. even say we were, we're now almost to nine years married, Mm -hmm. you know, this year. So we're here and it's just crazy how, how things turned out, you know, but how cultural differences, the church but yeah. then traditional ways of thinking of just because of where they came from as well. Like mm-hmm. it just how it can really, really put a lot of pressure on one yeah. as a as a kid, as a, as a child, not even so much as a child, but just as a person, mm-hmm. you being you, you know, and it's a lot like, you know. Yeah. 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 It sounds like uh, you really made like your first heart decision. Yeah. I you believe, know, from yes. the heart yes. rather than having to check all the boxes. Yes, I really yeah. did. Mm-hmm. I yeah. really, it was a rash decision. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of goes back to that, like, label, you know, like, where you fall from, I, I call it, you fall from people's grace, you know, like, you never fall from God's grace, but you fall from people's mm-hmm. grace because, you know, they have this label mm-hmm. and it's like, no, wait, wait, you're, you're supposed to be peanut butter, you know, yeah. like, you're supposed to be jelly, you're supposed to be this, you mm-hmm. know, and no, 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 how could you, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and it really does, um, like for her, like her story, you know, it just, it, it, I think that was, like she says, that was her first, um, uh, culture shock. Like, mm-hmm. I guess you could say with like being outside of like, man, you know, this is who I'm supposed to be. Mm-hmm. These are people's expectations of me. And when I didn't live up to that, 
you know, she was able to like really see and experience, you know what I mean? Like how, how cruel sometimes things can be when you don't live up to that mm-hmm. expectation, when you don't live up to that label. Yeah. And it's such a scary move, you know, because... Yeah to our parents it does feel like betrayal yes yeah right like these are this is the outline that i set out for you Mm -hmm. and if we're not if you're not matching if you're not living this outline you know um it's a betrayal it's a reflection on me on my parenting you know it's a reflection of what i pass down to you you know and so uh it's it's hard. It's it hard as an individual to decide to step out of those labels, to yeah. step out of those expectations and to choose from the heart, you know, what yeah. what you believe is true and authentic to you. Yeah. 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 That's good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what led you to be passionate about what you do now? Mm-hmm. What, what was how did that look like for you? I know you say you have. Um, you know, years of working and experience and you even, but what made you say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go to school for this. I'm going to pursue this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I think it goes back to, uh, childhood and to my upbringing, you know, being in the church, what were the values, you know, the values was service to others, Mm -hmm. service to others, kindness, empathy, right? Like, that's that's what I knew. I knew how to do those things, you know? And so knowing that those were my core values or values that I really just carried with myself throughout my life, um, that's really what drove my desire to want to become a therapist. Now, I didn't know that I would become a therapist in this way, yeah. right? Um, my initial thought was, hey, I want to help uh, or I want to work with people with severe mental illness. So I was actually looking into like forensic psychology okay. um, so I could work within the detention, work with, you know, people who um, were really struggling, you know, yeah. with with their mental health. Um but I'll be honest with you, there was a thesis that was involved in, <laughs> in that process. And I was like, you know, research is not really yeah. my thing. <laughs> research is not for me. You know, I want to be of service to yeah. people. Right. And so that's what ultimately led me to decide to go the clinical route. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's I've always wanted to help. Yeah, I've yeah. always loved to help. That's what I saw growing up. That's what my parents did. Yeah. You know, um, if anything, that's where I first saw counseling happen is my parents counseling other other folks within the church. Yeah. You know, so um, I knew that that's the route I wanted to take yeah. because of them, too. Because yeah. of the example that they set for me. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And there is and there always that good side of it you know i feel like sometimes i feel like sometimes we could talk about things like in a way where we try to make it look bad you know what i mean but like you said you saw the good side mm-hmm. of you know what i mean like how your parents you know being pastors you know they were they would sit down with people mm-hmm. and that's one of the beautiful things that mm-hmm. even to this day that you can see you know like where the 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 true intention you know what i mean really is to help people mm-hmm. you know to service people to really you know see them blossom see them grow see them change mm-hmm. you know see them um do better for their their themselves their marriage mm-hmm. you know so that's awesome that you you saw that and you said that man you know what i don't know exactly where mm-hmm. you know but i'm gonna pursue this and then little by little all this started to unfold exactly. you know and then um so now I want to get down to the, to the to the meat of stuff. Okay. You know what I mean? And I know that maybe a lot of people are even, you know, thinking about these type of subjects and are wondering, you know, what is it? How do I deal with it? Mm-hmm. And the first one is, you know, depression. Mm-hmm. You know, can you kind of walk us through what is depression and what are some of the, what are some of the symptoms? You know what I mean? Like even invisible symptoms. Mm-hmm. You know, because I was looking at um, just recently that depression sometimes can can we can have it and not even know it right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so can you kind of walk us through yeah yeah to speak a little bit on on what you said like we can have it and not even know it you know um we really have to discuss what the beliefs around mental health is right or what we've been told mental health 
mental health is or anxiety is or what depression is. You know, oftentimes um, we've been told or we've we've learned that uh, emotions are something we don't mess with. You know, yeah. it's like hey, you're feeling sad? Well, get up and go, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, you feel sad, but you got to still move. You got to still keep yeah. moving forward, you know? And so um, people don't really understand maybe what it is that they're experiencing because no one has actually given them the language to be able to describe, yeah. you know, what it is that they experience. Yeah. The other factor is um, because we don't have the language, we, we also maybe haven't been given the space to be able to say, hey, I'm sad. Like who who is sitting with me and giving me the time, giving me their attention, really intentionally listening to what I have to say, um, you know, that's often not available, right, to, to a lot of people. And so um, when it comes to depression, some symptoms that people can see is, yes, sadness, right? That's kind of the, yeah. the overall uh, idea that we have with, with depression. But we also see fatigue. Um, we also see lack of interest or anhedonia. Um, we see low self-esteem, feelings of worthlessness, helplessness, hopelessness. For some people, there may be um, some, some thoughts of not wanting to live. Um, so those are some symptoms that you, you can see when it comes to depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you want to kind of ask about that? No, I'm just listening right now. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's there's so much right now that that you know, kind of wanted because I could talk. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> so, so I I have to be like you know, hey, is there anything because, um, you know that that is something that I know a lot of people and it's I it's and I'm so glad I'm glad that it's becoming there's more awareness to it there's mm -hmm. a lot more awareness to to depression and um i even speak about it a little bit um on uh, on my story you know where when i first discovered you know when that started to really become real in our life it was through my mom you know it was my mom and um you know i was maybe in my early 20s i want to say mm -hmm. maybe where my mom started to have you know some very very she was going through some big life changes in her own personal life you know and um so she started to really have really bad episodes, really bad episodes, you know, and we didn't know, you know, at that time, you know, we're talking maybe mid 2000s when that started to happen, you know, and I was already, you know, in the church. I was already, you know, and I had already embarked in my journey of change and things like that, but it still was just a foreign language to mm -hmm. me, you know, it really was. And and like you said, there was no, even me, like I, I, I look back and I, I feel bad because I didn't know how to provide that space. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to provide that space. And I think that there's a lot of people out there that are even on the other side of the spectrum, you know, maybe with a family member, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a loved one, um, a friend, a colleague, that maybe you see some of those signs, maybe you see them, but it's like, how do I provide that space? Mm -hmm. You know, can you maybe shed some light on that? Like how can maybe on the other side of, of things, like as a friend, a loved one, a colleague, how can I provide that space for them? How mm -hmm. can I be aware and provide it? Yeah. Well, I just want to acknowledge you because I know it's, it's such a hard thing to witness, you know, your, yeah. your loved one, you know, suffer, mm -hmm. you know, and to be in so much pain and not know what to do with that, you yeah. know, um, one feels helpless, you know, when, yeah. when they see their loved one just struggling, yeah. you know, so, um, it's, you know, it's not your fault and <laughs> it really is that no one has really taught us how to show up for people, yeah. you know, or what resources we have, yeah. you know, so, um, if you know you you have someone in your life that is struggling with depression you do see them you know maybe they have expressed to you hey i'm not i'm not well you know i'm not doing well um i would encourage people to first ask their loved ones how they can be a support to them mm -hmm. 
Oftentimes we uh, assume that we know what yeah. to do, mm-hmm. right? Um, when and, and oftentimes we offer support that our loved ones don't actually really want or need, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes we offer unsolicited advice or, mm-hmm. you know, words, uh, words of encouragement that may not actually be encouraging, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? So mm-hmm. getting curious, get curious about, um, get, getting curious and allowing people to tell you yeah. exactly what they need. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. I think that's it's good. a really good point about what you said right now about the encouraging words that sometimes really they probably just don't even want to hear. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, because I think I deal with that a lot, you know, because I actually, you know, my husband's story, he's mentioned about even him personally, mm-hmm. you know, that he deals with that a lot, mm-hmm. you know, he with his depression and just how he yeah. feels and you know, we're totally opposites Mm -hmm. (laughs) on how we deal with things, you know? So even bringing that up, like it's, I, I've learned to kind of give him his space, but then it's like, when do you know when to not give space? Mm -hmm. When do you know when to say something, when to not, because you just feel like you don't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so, I think it's hard Mm -hmm. recently, like, with a lot of things that have been going on, we've been following this page. It's called Mental Health, right? Like, I think, yeah, something, something like that, Mental, mental health. health. And it talks about depression a lot, mm-hmm. you know, or uh, anxiety, things like that. You know, what to, like tips, you know, mm-hmm. on what you'll see when someone has depression, you know. Yeah. And I've learned little tips on that, you know, but then too, sometimes it's just, but then too, like sometimes, like what you said too, like, sometimes we don't even know if we might have it ourselves Mm -hmm. so now you pointing that i'm like uh do i get it like you know (laughs) do i have it you know because it's a lot Mm -hmm. when you know someone it's like you're hurting when someone's hurting Mm -hmm. right and so it's like one's hurting you know so it's like so we're both trying to get through it right like so what how would you how would you want to give a tip or encourage others like when they're in that boat mm-hmm. i guess you can say when one is feeling that way and your the other the, maybe the spouse or the friend or you know whoever it is on the other side trying to help that person that's that you know that their loved one is feeling depressed but then too maybe they're feeling it too because they're hurting too you know mm-hmm. for because of their during the process during the process yeah. like how how what would you encourage them i think a lot of people are going through that yeah yeah you know um witnessing someone else experience depression can be painful to you but that is not a direct uh it's not saying that you also have depression yeah. right so it the truth is that we experience emotions, you right. know, we're sentiment beings first, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, seeing someone in pain, we that's part of the empathy. We also feel their pain, you know, yeah. we feel pain because they're hurting. Um, but really, it's about getting to know your what's what's inside of you right doing the inner work for yourself getting to know your own emotions Mm -hmm. practicing how to label uh what you're feeling Mm -hmm. you know Uh, i brought up language earlier like oftentimes we don't have the language to really know what it is that we're feeling and language is huge language allows us to understand um and so really doing the work for yourself right knowing um what it is that you're experiencing experiencing because what we tend to do is we tend to take responsibility for how other people feel right and so when we see someone experiencing low mood you know or experiencing depression we end up making it about ourselves Mm. you know and we don't want to do that we want to keep the focus on the help that the other person needs um because they're the ones asking for the help, right? right. Or they're the ones needing the help. Um, and so starting to do the work, you know, within yourself is is important so that you can show up for other people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, and it's really true, you know, as far as the, the language and the awareness, you know, I, because when I started to 
when I first when it first started to come into my life, it was like I mentioned through my mom, and um, you know seeing her go through what she went through, seeing the episodes and the diagnosis that mm -hmm. later she was, you know, given things like that. Like it was it was very hard to accept, you know, mm -hmm. to see this, you know, because our whole life, you know, we didn't have the best relationship, you know, but we did have, you know, our mom. We had our mom. We had a good relationship. Um, you know, she taught us a lot. She showed up for us a lot. And, um, you know, even when they were going through problems, you know, they still made it a, she still made it a point to show up. You know, she would always do her best. And so my brother and I, we knew her as this strong, mm -hmm. you know, um, independent, hardworking, you know, um, seven days a week, she would go to the gym, mm -hmm. you know, she would be there for like two, three hours, like, I mean, my mom was like, she was, at, there was a time in her life where she was bad, you know what I mean? Like where you didn't want to mess with my mom. She was short. She's like five foot or probably like four foot 11, maybe short, but she, she was a, a force to be reckoned with, you know? And uh, we have stories, man. And, um, you know, so it was very difficult to like see that. And then when we finally came to terms to like, yeah, you know what? This is real. Mm -hmm. This is real our mom is going through this we just have to be the best that we can but then when it the next phase was like when it started to hit me mm -hmm. you know it started to hit me in a way and I remember the first time and I even shared a post so I'll share about it right now a little bit the first time I actually you know started to acknowledge that I didn't know what was going on you know mm -hmm. I didn't know how to identify what was going on inside of me. Mm -hmm. I think I was just living, you know, things were happening. You know, we had our, we had our, um, our first boy, our first son, he was born, you know, we, um, things were going good. You know, we, he was growing up, um, uh, you know, financially we were, you know, we're seeing breakthroughs, you know, we had just purchased our first home, mm -hmm. um, you know, things were looking good. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I came across, you know, a situation where, you know, my, my temper was tempted, mm -hmm. you know, I, I got, you know, really angry, really agitated. And I had a confrontation with an individual where, you know, I just didn't, you know, I, I gave in to what I was feeling, you know, which I didn't understand at that moment, mm -hmm. but I just had to let everything bottle up. Mm -hmm. And I remember I ended up just exploding. Mm -hmm. I ended up just exploding and I ended up, you know, hurting this individual, you know, in a way where, you know, that I was maybe what, like 29 or 30 years old at that time. I was like 29 or 30 years old at that time. The last confrontation I had mm -hmm. of something like that, I was maybe 18 years old. So 12 years of, mm -hmm. you know, you know, peaceful altercations, you know, like being able to handle situations, things. And I remember from that moment, like my world emotionally, you know, spiritually, everything just started to crumble mm -hmm. because I, I, I fell into this world of like, who am I? Mm -hmm. Like, what have I done? Mm -hmm. What am I doing? What is wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And it was a very, 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 very dark time mm -hmm. in my life. And, and I shared that story on a post because I really feel that that's really where offbeat mm -hmm. you know started because I started to really question why can't I just be normal mm. you know like yeah. why can't I just be normal <laughs> what did normal mean to you not fighting you know not being angry mm -hmm. um, being able to have a normal conversation with my wife mm. You know, at that time, being being able to be a dad to my son, mm -hmm. you know, like I felt like I couldn't even enjoy mm -hmm. my time with my son. I still struggle with that sometimes, you mm -hmm. know, it's gotten better, but um, guilt, you know, mm -hmm. I was consumed with so much guilt. People's opinions about me would get to me um, because that's really what afterwards when I did a lot of the work, I understood that what fueled me so much was mm -hmm. because this person was he was he was judging me you know mm -hmm. he was judging me and he didn't know me mm -hmm. you know and but he was pointing things out to me that 
that uh, my whole life have been pointed out things that you know i was just it, it was like just everything that i you know i'm just i was just tired of it mm-hmm. i was just tired of living under people's umbrella people's label you know and it just i just snapped mm-hmm. you know i snapped and i was like man and i was like why can't i just be these things mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, oftentimes we get trapped into this idea of normal, right? And the reality is, normal doesn't exist, you know? Um, As a perfectionist, right? Someone who, uh, you know, I think that really comes from childhood too, having to meet these expectations and check off these boxes, right? Um, Being a perfectionist, right? Like that's another label, another expectation to live up to, right? Being normal, right? It's another expectation to live up to. And so when we live in these boxes, we we have nowhere to go, you know? We have nowhere to explore. We, if we step out of the box, what what happens, you know? Like, you feel lost. But because where, where was the freedom? Where was the freedom in, in that allowed you to explore, you yeah. know, other parts of you? What I'm hearing is you yeah. were <laughs> expecting to be the perfect dad. You were expecting to be the perfect husband, you know? Yeah. Or whatever that normal was to you. Yeah. You were expecting those things to to be in the way that you um picture them yeah you know and when it didn't reflect that the world cr- crumbled yeah yeah and it, it really it really did because it it just i just felt like i couldn't meet up to my expectations mm-hmm. you know and it wasn't even because my wife was had these expectations for me mm-hmm. it wasn't even because you know it, what, it really, really did come down to, like, my expectations, mm-hmm. you know, and and living up to... And that was one thing that I had always struggled with that later, you know, I as I did the work, as as I, um, I myself, you know, because that situation was mm-hmm. what really propelled me to say, I got to get therapy, mm-hmm. you know, I got to get therapy, you know, because 12 years, you know, I, I was good, you know, yeah, I had my, ang- you know, episodes, I had, you know, who doesn't get mad, who doesn't mm-hmm. get upset, mm-hmm. but it had gotten to the point where it scared me, mm-hmm. it really did, it scared me, because I said, man, like, I, what, I've never, the last time I was that person, I was 18 years old, mm-hmm. I was 18 years old, I was in a gang, I was, you know, doing that life, I was indulged in that life, so, and that's what was expected to, of me, mm-hmm. But now, like, what what was my excuse? Why did I react that way? You know, and but a lot of it had to do with my identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know who I was, Mm -hmm. you know, and that was one of the biggest things at 30 years old, you know, not knowing who you are Mm -hmm. as a person, as a man, you know, because my whole life, I always lived in the shadows of others. Mm -hmm. I always I always look for that approval of my dad. You know, I always look, and when I didn't get that approval or I felt like I didn't get that approval, you know, I would look for it with my mom. Mm-hmm. And when I didn't feel like I had that approval because there was always just something that I felt like I didn't meet. Mm-hmm. You know, there was always a criteria, you know, and I think that's why when I joined a gang, I felt like I felt like the like everything was just perfect mm-hmm. because as I look back on it, it wasn't so much because of what we were doing, but it was because I was so good at doing it and I w- it was so accepting. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I had people around me that loved me for what I did. Mm-hmm. You know, they knew what I was capable of. They encouraged what I was capable of. They loved what I did. I mean, we had a good time doing what we did and it felt good mm-hmm. to be a part of mm-hmm. something. You know, mm-hmm. and being able to meet those expectations. Yeah. It sounds like you were really looking for a place of belonging. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really. Right. Yeah, there's, um, you know, there's a difference between fitting in and finding a place of belonging, you yeah. know? And because we, we uh, desire belonging so yeah. much... Um, and we don't really know where to find that, uh, we will sacrifice ourselves to fit in. 
you know so it'll come at a cost what are you sacrificing maybe yeah. you're sacrificing some of you know your family maybe you're sacrificing money maybe you're sac- uh, sacrificing time yeah you know like fitting in gives you a false sense of belonging yeah you know a hundred percent but what did it cost you exactly exactly mm-hmm. and that's what i always look back on and say like man it really did cost me so much like Mm -hmm. it cost me my high school years Mm -hmm. you know it cost me my freedom Mm -hmm. you know for so many years you know it cost me relationships Mm -hmm. you know that good relationships that I had Mm -hmm. you know with family with friends it cost so much you know and and um and I think that that was the terrible thing that I never dealt with that you Mm -hmm. know and I can't blame anyone but that was something I just never dealt with and even as a 30 year old, I found myself still dealing with that because my desire to fit in, mm-hmm. and I love how you explain that because it's mm-hmm. so true. My desire to fit in to a system, to an organization, to a way of being, to a normal, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like this is normal. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, if you're in this church, this is, this is normal. Mm-hmm. This is, this is acceptable. And, you know, or if you're part of this community or if you're part of this, like this is what normal is. Mm -hmm. And so I've always strived to, okay, you know, if I I understood this was wrong, bad consequences, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to change, you know, and then but then instead of working on, you know, saying, who am I? Mm -hmm. Who is my identity? How do I belong? I went back to that mentality of like, how do I fit in? Mm -hmm. How can I fit in these pockets? Where can I go? And when I felt that, you know what, like, because I think that's what it really came down to. It's like, man, you know what? I am tired of this. Mm -hmm. I am tired of this. I am tired of feeling like this. I'm tired of people making me feel like this. And it was just an explosion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So what, what he's saying, right, like, well, I think because growing up, right, like, of always, like, also, like, trusting in God. Like, mm-hmm. you know, what does God want for us? You know, mm-hmm. that's always a question, right? Like, as believers, mm-hmm. you know, like, what does God want for us, you know? And so how do we know? Because, right, we know we have feelings and sometimes our emotions, sometimes we don't know whether if they're good or not, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Like, and I think for me, yeah. well, for us. I think that's always the hard part to yeah. really recognize are our feelings wrong or right? Mm-hmm. Is this yeah. what God wants or or is it not? Mm-hmm. Like, how, how can we really recognize if we're doing the right thing? Mm-hmm. Like with choices mm-hmm. in our lives, decisions, you know, when it comes down to having, picking our friends, mm-hmm. relationships, mm-hmm. when it comes down to even in our depression like Mm -hmm. is you know is this okay to feel like this you know Mm because i bet you that's always the answer is it okay that i feel this way i know that's always his quite telling when we have our conversations about it like am i wrong am i wrong for thinking this yeah like you know like (laughs) i I don't know if you've ever had conversations with other people like in 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 this area Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. but how would you how would what 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 sort of tip or Mm -hmm. you know to help guide someone that's going through that you know and really you know recognizing those things yeah in their lives that's a great question yes i do work with people um on like rebuilding and redefining their relationship with their emotions um the truth is we live in a society we've grown up in certain constructs right that are very polarizing right what do i mean by that like two extremes Mm -hmm. right it's either good or it's either bad Mm -hmm. right it's either positive or it's either negative right like if it's not one thing it's another right or it's all or it's nothing right what the truth is we are really looking to live in the gray What, what's in between? What's in between these two extremes, mm-hmm. right? And so I have this conversation with, with people when it comes to emotions because we've 
we've uh, been raised to believe that we have good emotions and we have bad emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The truth is we have emotions Mm -hmm. (laughs) that they're neither good or bad. You know, some of your emotions are pleasant. Mm -hmm. Some of your emotions are unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's that's speaking to the experience that you have with your emotions. Is sadness unpleasant? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Is fear unpleasant? Yes. Is anguish unpleasant? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. But none of those are bad. Mm-hmm. We've learned, you know, we've been told that those are bad emotions. Yeah. Um, but they're neither good or bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just are. They're yeah. emotions. I love that. I love that so much. And I love how you you describe that. Um, working with people to come to rebuilding that relationship mm-hmm. with their emotions. And I think that that is what, that's one thing that... Um, I have been learning little by little throughout these last years is really being able to recognize, you know, like you said, do I feel angry? Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think that I was always so scared of that emotion Mm -hmm. because I would see the negative effects of it or I would, you know, um, react, Mm -hmm. you know, to that. You know, but when you learn to have a relationship, well, why do you have angry? Mm -hmm. You know, and I kind of like like it because it's kind of like you going up to a buddy and being Mm -hmm. like hey you know why do you feel that way you know and it's kind of like doing that to yourself Mm -hmm. you know like hey why do you feel that way Mm -hmm. you know why do you feel angry and when it really comes down to you know it's like oh you you know what i i am angry but in reality like i feel embarrassed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know yeah you bring up a good point Mm -hmm. right that emotions uh tend to come in like bunches right yeah. it's not just the one emotion that you yeah. experience right i can right. i'm sitting in this chair and i'm excited to be here but yeah. also like i'm a little nervous <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. like they it's not just one experience with one emotion yeah. right but it's just it's so, so many, many. Yeah. and that's why it becomes overwhelming right because yeah. again we haven't learned how to experience the emotions in our physical body yeah. you know like how how often are you paying attention to how sadness feels in your body mm. where do you feel it yeah. do you feel it in your chest do you feel it in you know your belly do you feel it in your throat you know mm. in your face like where where are you experiencing it mm. and that's what building a relationship with your emotions is right yeah. is knowing how they express themselves mm. within you yeah. right and also being able to give it a name so mm-hmm. that when it shows up, mm-hmm. it's not unfamiliar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not something you've never seen before or felt before, right? Yeah. But you can recognize it and you can tend to it. Mm, I love mm-hmm. that. I love that. Yeah. And that's so good because I know she's, like like my wife, Like I always tell people, emotionally, she's much more mature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like much more mature than I am, you know, And but I'm learning. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one thing that I'm, definitely definitely learning is how to identify the emotions Mm -hmm. you know how to present them how to name them you know do I still struggle in some areas oh yeah of course Mm -hmm. but I feel like I've definitely gotten better at you know being able to explain you know after the fact or you know during the the situation like Mm -hmm. man you know what in reality it's not it's angry that I'm ex- it's anger that I'm expressing but in reality it's because you know I feel rejected mm-hmm. or I feel embarrassed mm-hmm. or I feel sad or I feel worried mm-hmm. you know worried that you know I might not be able to figure things out mm-hmm. you know and I'm and then that turns into anger with myself because mm-hmm. then it's like what am I doing you know for example things like that you know mm-hmm. right yeah. But yeah, she's definitely the more <laughs> emotionally mature one. Definitely. <laughs> one thing I want to clarify, too, is, you know, because we experience anger, we experience rage, right? Um, does not mean that you can go out and harm someone, right? Yeah. Or be disrespectful some, to someone. Right. Like Just because you acknowledge that that's what you feel, or you're expressing to someone that that's, that that's how you feel, doesn't give you permission to mm-hmm. cause harm, right? Yeah. Your emotion is valid. We right. could understand why you feel that way, right? right? But the way that you respond to that emotion may not always be justified. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So just because you feel something yeah. you know doesn't necessarily mean that you can go out and cause harm to someone yeah it's still 
And I think that's what's so hard is being able to still accept responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, for your actions, you know, taking responsibility for like, hey, you know, if you did that, because like, for example, the situation that I had gone through, like, that's one thing that it just it taught me was that, man, it just I can't keep going through life doing that, even though that was the first time in many, many years. But regardless, I said, you know what, I need to take responsibility for this in any way possible. And the first thing is by, you know, regardless of the outcome, I need to get help. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to get this, these emotions, this depression. I need to get it. I need to f not so much get it under control, but I need to, you know, really figure out what is it that's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that's really going on inside of me? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I that leads to my next question is that do you is that something that you constantly see is that people just want to deal with symptoms but they don't want to go deep mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you for asking that question because you know one disclaimer that i often give uh when i start therapy with people is um well actually i should give you all of my expectations right <laughs> or the expectations that i lay out for people because people will come to therapy and say hey i just need a couple of sessions right. and yeah. you know all should be good right. you know um but the reality is that when you make the decision to embark on a therapeutic journey right you are you are deciding to commit to yourself right yeah. and this is a lifelong process yeah. you know we are complex human beings who are ever evolving mm -hmm. you know who you are today was not who you were 10 years ago, yeah. five years ago, maybe even last year, maybe mm -hmm. a couple months ago, right? right? We are ever evolving species. So we, this is going to be a lifelong journey. We're, yeah. we're committing to ourselves for, you know, long term. People do come to therapy and say, hey, give me the steps. What are the steps that you have? so that I can address this. And mm -hmm. sure, there's coping skills, there's ways to address certain things. Um, but really, therapy is a space where you go in mm -hmm. and you dig, dig. out, yeah. you know, the core beliefs, yeah. you know, the expectations. Yeah. And you explore how they've impacted every part of your life, yeah. you know, and where it can continues to show up because yeah. you may think okay well I address this this issue in my relationship right yeah. and a year later it's showing up at work mm -hmm. or you know a few months is showing up with friends yeah you know so we understand that yes even though we address it in one area you know there's still maybe more work that we have to do yeah so, so talking about that um I'm thinking because I think especially though you know we're latinos mm -hmm. you know and i feel like for us okay let me see the question where i'm trying to get at it you know i have to like put my words together <laughs> like so what would you tell someone that's latino or like how you said but what's the thing that you call it? bipoc yeah <laughs> they have this sort of background that because i know that there's a lot of people they say they might say i don't need their therapy mm -hmm. you know i don't need counseling you know, I'm going to pray about it. Mm -hmm. It's not normal to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not normal to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I know the question too. like, I know the question is, can be like, why are people afraid, especially like with Latino background, you yeah. know, and why do you think, or even encouraging them like to do it? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like why it, it's important? Because I think that that is a big thing right now what you just pointed out about the going deep. Going deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you think people are so afraid to go deep? Mm -hmm. You know? Like, because I know, like, that was him in the beginning. Yeah. You know, like, I would tell him, like, we mm -hmm. were going through it. We were going through it. And I was like, you need help. I cannot help you anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was, you know, when he would go through it, he was feeling a certain way. I, of course, I was trying to be that partner, mm -hmm. that spouse, always encouraging, you know, mm -hmm. praying for him. Like, we're going to get through this, you know, like, just, you know, release, mm -hmm. release what you have to say. It's okay. If you hurt me, you hurt me, but mm -hmm. release. But it just wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough. You know, um, that was our, but everybody has their own story. Everybody mm -hmm. has their own marriage. Everybody has their, what they go through with their families. Right. So what would you tell them? Like, mm -hmm. why is it so important to really go deep? 
with, you know, because there's people that are perfectionists, like just what you said, Mm -hmm. but then there's people that are not perfectionists and they just kind of go with the flow, but then they still deal with all these things, Mm -hmm. all these emotions and what they go through, you know? So why, like, why, what would you tell the people, like, why is it important to really dig deep within themselves, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know, it's important to dig deep because that's where you find your true authentic self. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we say we're digging through things, we're digging through the labels, we're Mm. digging through the expectations, right? We are assessing whether that is something that continues to align with me or it only aligned with me because I was told it was supposed to, Mm. you know? And so it's, this journey of going through therapy is um, is really about getting to know who you are outside of who you've been told that yeah. you are. Yeah. yeah, you know, and that's why it's important because we have moments in life where we thought we checked off all the boxes, yeah. but it wasn't enough, yeah. right? Because right. those things were probably not in alignment with you. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's so good, and I love that question, and I love the way you answered it because it's true. It's it really, and I always tell people when I encourage people to seek out therapy, mm-hmm. seek out counseling, and and even why I did it because it was scary to open up to someone you don't know, mm-hmm. you know, in a space that you don't know. But what I, what I came to find out for myself, and maybe this can encourage people, was that honestly, I think going to a complete stranger, you know, a professional. Um, you know, with experience, it actually was the best Mm -hmm. because it really did allow me to, because sometimes what I used to feel was that every person that I knew had kind of like what you talked about earlier, they already had like their baggage of advice. Mm -hmm. You know, they already had the right scriptures, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know, they already had, you know, um, you know, you need to pray more, Mm -hmm. you know, they already had, they had this, their baggage of advice of tips, you know what I mean? And and it's nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong with that. But when you come to a point, when you come to a place where there's things that, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when you're, you build something, you know, like, let's say you, you, you build a desk, you know, Mm -hmm. let's say, you know, well, let's take this desk, for example, and I build it from scratch and, and it keeps wobbling, you know, and, and sometimes like we're like, ah, I don't I don't feel like deconstructing this. I don't feel mm-hmm. like pulling this apart anymore. Like it's done. It's mm-hmm. done. It's good. It's we just need it just to put things on top of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, a la brava, you mm-hmm. know, like the, mm-hmm. como el mexicano, you know, <laughs> and and sometimes our life we're like that. We're just like, well, that's that's how it is. You know, my life is like that. This area in my life is like that. You know, there's no reason to go back, you know, because I think a lot of people even that, like they say, oh, I don't want to be the victim. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll get that mindset. Cause that was my mindset too. It's like, I don't want to be a victim. You know, I don't want to, you know, sit there and blame everyone for what I'm going through. I want, I'm taking responsibility, mm-hmm. but they don't realize that that is part of taking responsibility. Mm-hmm. You know, that was part of me taking responsibility to say, no, this area is broken, mm-hmm. you know, and I've put on the suit, I've put on the tie, I've said the right things. I've said the right prayer. You know, um, I, you know, God's not going anywhere, but I really believe that this is a way of God, you know, pushing us and, 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 and pulling us through so that we can deconstruct those areas, Mm -hmm. you know, and really, you know, look at these areas and, and see that, you know what, there was yesterday, I was listening to this, that early on, many times early on in our lives, that infrastructure Mm -hmm. was broken, Mm -hmm. you know, without us even knowing it's like going back to the table. Maybe there was a screw that I forgot to put in. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was, maybe I intentionally left the part out and that's why it's wobbly, Mm -hmm. you know, because I didn't want to deal with it. And many times in our life, like the way we grow up, the way we were raised, what we were told, you know, it's, we've said, ah, okay, well it works at that moment, Mm -hmm. but not knowing that we were already messing up the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so now that we're older and we actually need it, you know, where we need those coping skills, where we need those communication skills, it's like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I want to ask, like, who is in charge of the infrastructure when you're a child? Mm. Your parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your parents are, you know? And 
you know, the truth is um, in Latino culture, you know, especially with our older generations, mental health, therapy, guess that's all. Like, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Estás ansiosa? Just pray about it. Yeah. You know? You know, yeah. like you're you're sad. Well, get over it. Vete a trabajar. Vete a hacer yeah. algo. Yeah. Ponte a limpiar. Ponte you a know? limpiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that is where you learned how to deal. You know, how to deal with with your emotions. How to deal yeah. with yourself. You know. So our parents did the best they could. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They did the best that they could with what they had. Yeah. You know. Um, and it's not to say that our parents were bad or yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but it's the truth you know we we still going back to this polarized right like we think like oh our parents should have done the best you know or all they could right but the truth is they were limited too in their resources and their knowledge and where where was their freedom you know where was their safe space to explore exactly Mm -hmm. and and i agree totally you know because i always go back i always think that you know I go back to my high school years because mm-hmm. <laughs> there's there's things that I wanted to do. You know, I remember the and this is a, a funny story, but it's because I remember that for my senior year, I, I just wanted to do one thing, you know, that was out of the norm, mm-hmm. you know, of being a Christian, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I wanted to go to prom. I wanted to go to prom mm-hmm. so bad. I, I was either go to grad night or go to prom. And I don't know why I wanted to go to prom. Mm. I wanted to have that experience of yeah. what it was to be a senior, mm-hmm. to go to a dance. Because throughout my whole pretty much four years of high school, I think I went once in middle school because it was during school. But I never went to a dance, never went to really a football game. And it was my choice because, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I was in, I was involved in church. You know, I wanted to be in church. Mm-hmm. You know, that was my choice. It wasn't my parents' choice. Like, mm-hmm. yes, they, they gave that example. You know, they, they guided me in that way. And but at the end, it was my choice, and I was happy with that. Mm-hmm. But senior year came, and you know, I'm getting ready to leave the, the high school, and I'm like, man, what have I, what have I really experienced? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? You know, and. Um, And I remember asking my parents, like, mom, dad, like, I want to go to prom. Like, Mm -hmm. can I go to prom? I think I asked my mom first. And she was like, well, ask your dad. All the time. It's always (laughs) that they will ask your dad. You know? But yeah, (laughs) pregúntale tu papá. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Like, so I asked my dad. And then Mm -hmm. he's like, well, pregúntale tu mamá. All the time. Like, they didn't want to make the choice, Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm just like, so I finally sat with them and they would ask, well, why? I'm like, well, because, like, I just... I want to have this experience, like, and there's a mm-hmm. pas- 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 well, well, yeah, like, I'm going to dance with my friends, mm-hmm. like, but it's nothing bad, like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drink, I mean, there's mm-hmm. not going to be drinks allowed, like, there's nothing of that, like, right. I know my boundaries, like, you know, I know my boundaries, you know, yeah. I know what's my limits, mm-hmm. you know, but I want to be able to experience this, you know, and, and you know what, I, I really talk to them, I, I express myself to them, and you know they're open about it. They let me go. Mm-hmm. They let me go. I even I even got a date. Sorry, babe. <laughs> you know I even got a date. I asked a friend to go with me. Uh, it was a guy, of course. <laughs> and you know he went with me. You know, and we had fun. I had fun with my friends. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and I'm so happy that I got to experience that. I prefer to go. I wanted to go to prom instead of grad night. You know, mm-hmm. grad night was at Disneyland and doing all that. But I was like, it's okay. But I don't know why. I just want to experience this. Mm-hmm. You know, and. To be able to let my parents, because throughout my whole school years, like I was saying, like I wanted to do things. I wanted to get into sports. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to do volleyball. I wanted, you know, I wanted to try those things. But when I would ask my parents, would be like, "Well, you know, say cómo hacer eso? I don't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, well, how we, how do we do that? Well, we don't have the money for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pero y la iglesia, mm-hmm. but church. What about church? You're gonna miss church and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I'm just like, Ugh. so I always had to kind of make a choice. Mm-hmm. You know, what do I want? Do I want to be involved? Because of the service and because of what they taught me and how I've always thought too of like being of service to others, mm-hmm. so I would I would always go you know I would always make that choice like okay I want I want to do this you know and I don't regret it you know because I love I love giving service to others other mm-hmm. young people like of my age at that time you know that I was helping and being there for and be, being friends for and stuff like that you know and so. But to that point, I'm like, okay, I want to do something, mm-hmm. you know, I want, yeah. I made a choice and, and to know that my parents had supported me, I think for me at that time, that was, 
a big thing for me. It was mm -hmm. a big deal, you know? So yeah. I kind of just wanted to explain give that story <laughs> yeah 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 you know uh, again our parents are doing you know they they did and they are doing the best that they can they may yeah. not be open to everything you know ex <laughs> open to everything or even yeah. you know open to exploring their own mental health yeah. you know yeah. i've encouraged my parents to go and see a therapist <laughs> but they're you know they always yeah. tell me no <laughs> yeah. you know because yeah. it's painful you yeah. know like we've yeah. You know, we've learned that like whatever has happened, you you leave it in the past. Don't even bring right. it up again. Right. Yeah. But what we fail to acknowledge is that even though we've left it in the past, it still, still impacts can. us in yeah. the present. Exactly. You yeah. know, and that was one of the things that was scary for me, too, mm -hmm. was because I the thing is the past for me, you know, not everything was bad in the past, but there was a lot of things in the past you know, even as an adult, you know, that I would use as guilt, you know, mm -hmm. so visiting the past for me always associated with guilt, mm -hmm. you know, regret, guilt, um, you know, uh, just, you know, it was a real bad ex relationship that I had with it, you know, and it wasn't until I was able to go to therapy that I was able to learn that, mm -hmm. that, you know what, it's, it's not so much that we bring up the past so that we can relive it or, um, you know, stay there or, you know, play the blame game, but it really is to, okay, what can we learn from these situations? Mm -hmm. You know, because I know that, um, my mom, you know, that was one of the biggest things that, you know, she struggled with a lot, you mm -hmm. know, when she went into her situation, you know, with, um, um, with depression, anxiety and things like that. It was, I think she, she felt like, um, her biggest thing was like she would constantly always like apologize to us mm. constantly 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 and uh you know i think she felt a lot of a lot of guilt you know mm -hmm. like you know just things that maybe she could have done better mm -hmm. things like that and i would always try to encourage her. i was like look mom, like you did the best that you can you know you did everything that you can even to my dad you know like you do the best you got they did the best you know that they knew how to do with what they had and, um, you know, we made our choices, like the choices we made, they weren't based off of them. You know, mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it might've created things inside of us, you know what I mean? That, but ultimately we made that choice, mm -hmm. you know, we made that decision and, and I had to really tell my mom, I'm like, look, like we made choices, mm -hmm. we made choices. You can't blame yourself for those choices. You know, are there things that could have been better? Yes, but let's learn from them. Mm -hmm. Let's learn from them. Let's move on from that, but let's not stay there, mm -hmm. you know, let's mm -hmm. not stay there. And I think that that is a lot, especially with the older generation that they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of, or even they're, I'll be, I'll be, I'll dare to say sometimes like they're even afraid to admit mm -hmm. that maybe they were wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they admit it, if they acknowledge it, right, <laughs> then they have to deal with what comes with yeah. that right like yeah. they will have to experience the emotion they do have to experience right. the discomfort of yeah. sitting with that they might have been wrong yeah, yeah. sitting mm -hmm. with, with with you know the the mistake right you know or the yeah. outcome yeah. the result of, of yeah. that decision right. um yeah, it's it is difficult for, you know, our our elders, our older population, <laughs> yeah. you know, to really yeah. um acknowledge like themselves, you know. Yeah. Yes, one of, you know, one of the reasons to go back and and explore the past is to draw the lessons, but also to like make peace with that mm -hmm. by practicing acceptance, mm -hmm. you know? Um and that's really hard yeah. because we've we've learned that acceptance means allowance, right? If I accept that I did this, then I'm making it okay, gotcha. you know. Yeah. And that's that's not really what acceptance means. Yeah. Yeah. Acceptance is knowing that there's that what has happened has happened, and there is no more investment in changing it. Right. Whether it's active investment of like trying to make up for the past or mental investment of like thinking how I could have done that better, yeah. how I should have done that better or in the future. Right. Next time I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But just being able to say this is what happened, yeah. you know, and and I accept that this is what happened and right. I'm taking accountability. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I was gonna say to earlier about that. What was gonna go with that story that I was saying, <laughs> and we kind of go back to that is because now as a parent, uh -huh. I'm a parent. You know, we're parents now. We have a 10 year old daughter. We have a eight, almost eight year old son and a four year old boy. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like <laughs> we got a, a full Hands house. Full. Hands <laughs> full. <laughs> you know, and now because you know. We accepted certain things from our parents, but then there's going to be things where, you know, we know we want to do better, you know? So I knew there were certain things, like, of course, as a child, I wanted to do, but because of these traditional and just things that they just, I don't know, you know, yeah. didn't things, that we ex things that we accept, like, because kind of going back to where, like, like our parents were limited and right you know like hey i'm gonna go sign up for this sport well i don't know what to do and so they would just leave it like mm -hmm. that you right know? Mm -hmm. but now but now we as parents like we know yeah. how to do that mm -hmm. you know we know yeah. what the process is and also if we're financially okay then we're gonna do it too because i know like at, at that time yeah. my parents weren't as financially okay mm -hmm. you know probably to allow me to to play a sport because of now now as a parent i see how much it costs us to be in football <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. It, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of money you yeah. know it's a lot of, it's an investment <laughs> you right. know yeah. and um you know so i i think we as parents now and learning from our parents it's, it's like yeah accepting uh, even for us to accept i think you know we have to be okay accepting of how they taught us mm -hmm. but then learn and learning mm -hmm. what you know it's like how you're saying de deconstructing what we've learned mm -hmm. and i think we've talked about that before yeah. deconstructing what we've learned mm -hmm. you know and and i kind of want to go to the next question that we have on the list with this it's what we've learned in mm -hmm. but in regards to faith now mm -hmm. so how can what is what did, what does that look like mm -hmm. deconstructing faith yeah yeah i i come from i grew i grew up in the church mm -hmm. you know my yeah. parents were pastors since i was since before I was even born mm -hmm. or when I was born I don't know they've been now pastors over 30 years now so yeah. someone of faith that's a believer or even figuring out what is being a believer a Christian mm -hmm. of faith like how, what does that look like of deconstructing faith yeah mm -hmm. let's get mm -hmm. into that yeah yeah so you know I my aim is to help people feel safe in doing so you know um, as someone who grew up in the church, right, I honestly can't recall a time where I felt safe mm. to pose a question, you yeah. know, that may have gone against mm. what right. uh, I was told, right. you know. And so deconstruction is really about having the freedom, having a safe place to wonder, right. to question, you know, um, it's not necessarily like in, in therapy, I don't necessarily facilitate someone's deconstruction, you know, but I do provide a space where I say it's okay. It's okay yeah. for you to question. It's mm. okay for you to doubt. Mm. You know, it's okay for you to express yeah. those questions and yeah. those doubts. Yeah. Um, safety is really important when it comes to therapy, right? When it right. comes to navigating, you know, your inner world, um, having a safe place that's free of judgment, you know, that's yeah. open-minded, you know, that's... Uh, Willing to accept you just mm -hmm. as you are yeah. is important in that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, how does that how does that look like? And deconstructing the faith, mm -hmm. like how does that you know how does um how does that look like when like because like you said I like what you said you don't facilitate mm -hmm. the action itself but what you do is you create that safe space. And so, what does that look like? Because I know that maybe many of our listeners, mm -hmm. you know, are. Maybe they find themselves in a place where maybe they've been hurt, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe they've been um, um, in a situation where maybe they questioned something and now they're looked at like the black sheep, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe they maybe they haven't, you know, returned to church, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, because of something that took place, mm -hmm. you know, and they haven't found that safe space, mm -hmm. you know, to actually say, right. man, can I even... Because I think that that's, it's so, um, 
we see it so much yeah. you know i i think we see it so much where it's like you know you can almost be there's that word that i'm looking for they um excommunicate you almost mm. you know like where you're no longer seen as a human being mm -hmm. you know but you're seen as someone who has come against you know mm -hmm. a system mm -hmm. an organization mm -hmm. or a facility or you know and really it's just a group of people mm -hmm. you know what how does that look like yeah yeah you know um what comes to mind like just to give an example is purity culture right mm. we yeah. we're familiar with purity culture yeah, and what yeah. that looks like right there's these expectations for women mm -hmm. right and their womanhood mm -hmm. you know and if uh women step out of that you know what comes with that yeah you know comes with the labels comes with the judgment mm -hmm. you know comes with the changed perception mm -hmm. yeah. of them you know and so someone who comes to me in therapy um explores those beliefs you know they express what they believe um and we look at is that something that still aligns with you is mm -hmm. the idea that purity culture holds something that is true and authentic to you yeah. Yeah. is that something that really like feels like it's it's part of you you know and if yeah. it's not what is let's explore what is you know yeah let's also process the harm you know let's process the pain that comes with this particular you know in this example purity culture right. and how that has impacted you and how that has shaped your view of yourself of your womanhood mm. you know right. and do we again do we is is there parts of that that you want to continue to align with right or are there parts of that you that you want to redefine that yeah. you you know for yourself that feels more in alignment to you yeah mm -hmm. i love that because that's so, it's so good that's so good and I want to touch on that a little bit because I love what you said right now is that there's things that us, we, you know, creating safe space for people, mm -hmm. you know, and I believe that churches more than any, like we, they need, we need that. Like we need professionals. We need people even within the churches to be able to be those facilitators, you know, to have people be able to go in and, and because I love what you said right now is that, you know, how did it make you feel and do you still align mm -hmm. with certain things you know and i love that because sometimes like when the hurt factor comes in you know or you know when a person or individual is hurt or when um maybe you know maybe they they uh, maybe they made a mistake and 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 now it's looked at different you know and a lot of times what happens is that because because of the outcome sometimes we say man i want to I want to throw everything away, mm -hmm. but not knowing that, you know, I don't have to throw everything away. I can actually deconstruct and actually see that, you know what, there are certain things that I, I understand why, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I understand why I should have stayed away from that. I understand that now mm -hmm. and I understand what it's made me feel, but not because you guys have made me feel like that, mm -hmm. but because it's made me feel this mm -hmm. way. So I can understand that. But I still want to be humanized enough to where, you know, I want to be acknowledged that, you know, the way I'm treated is being is hurtful. Mm -hmm. You know, the way I'm being acknowledged is hurtful. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the way I'm being turned to the side is hurtful, mm -hmm. you know, and we need more more safe spaces like that, because what we see a lot is that when that happens, it's like, you know what, I'm just going to. And I know I was and I say that because I was a situation with us where. You know, when we came to a point where, you know, we weren't going to church, mm -hmm. you know, there was a time in our life where, you know, where we're like, you know what, we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go mm -hmm. because they're like, you know what, like, you know, the way we were made to feel was that, you know, you know, what what we did was just absolutely wrong. It's it's not it's you know, it's unforgivable. You know, where do we go? You know, and so I took it as like I don't want anything mm -hmm. to do with church at that moment you know and I'm so glad though that you know we were able to we were able to find you know we gave it a shot you know we we found a church um and shout out to Sandals Church mm -hmm. Sandals Church um you know right there in Riverside we found it and I don't know exactly how we I don't know if you found it first right um I don't know I thought you found it yeah you I think I saw, you, yeah. I saw a billboard I saw a billboard 
you know, and I think they're like, their motto is um, real with self, God and others. Yeah. 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 So I saw that and I was on my drive to work. I'm like, "Ah." you know, I looked it up. I was like, oh, it's right there. It was like literally right down the street from us, from where we live at that time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm so glad, I'm so glad that we said, let's give it a shot. And it was exactly what we needed. Mm -hmm. It was a safe space for us to go. Mm -hmm. And through these messages, it wasn't even through us opening up at that moment. It was just through the messages and we were able to see a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And it was able to show us a perspective of not so much that, yeah, we agree with everything that Mm -hmm. we're facilitating everything that, you know, that you're doing and we agree with. No, it wasn't so much that, but it was an acknowledgement of like, just, hey, this has happened in your life, but hey, God still loves you. Mm -hmm. You know, their, you know, his love, his, his opinion, his image of you, your identity in him has not been shaken, has Mm -hmm. not changed, has Mm -hmm. not, you know, has not vanished, you know? Yes, people are people, but it was able to create that space where, like you said, we were able to see, hey, what, what we did, you know? And we were able to see what does align with us Mm -hmm. and what doesn't anymore, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. No, yeah, it really helped us a lot, you know? I was going to say something, but I just left it. (laughs) (laughs) But... It allowed us to deconstruct. Yeah. Yes, kind of going back to that word, it allowed us to deconstruct, even for myself, Mm -hmm. it allowed me to deconstruct what I had learned. Mm -hmm. It's because like what he said, like it was the messages. We didn't get involved in that church. Like Mm -hmm. we just went to church. I knew for me, like I knew I needed, I needed to go to church. Mm -hmm. I needed God. Like just being at home and hearing worship music, praying for me, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. We, I did it. We did it for a couple of weeks, I think. But then I was just like, we got to go back to, to he did it. Claire, I didn't do that. I wasn't, (laughs) but that was me. (laughs) I wasn't putting on worship. I wasn't praying. Like I was, I was done. Not done, but like not done with God. But I was done with religion. No, I was yeah. done with organization. I, I'm I was ta- done. I'm talking about myself. Yeah. So <laughs> that was me. And, you know, I knew that I we needed to go to church. Mm-hmm. Like, I, that's just always been... I grew up mm-hmm. in, and I, in, in the church knowing God. And I just knew, again, going back to the thing, like, my mindset is always, I want to please God. Mm-hmm. I want to please God, you know, in whatever I do, whatever choice I make. No matter how bad it is, like, I just want to get back up and please God through it, you know, however, because I know he's going to forgive me, you know, I know he loves me, you know, and I know he loved him, like, you know, I just, I know that I'm not going to give up on that, Right. like, why, Mm -hmm. why, why, why even give up on that, Mm -hmm. you know? That is the overall reason why we are still, we are here, yeah. is because we are God's creation, yeah. you know? And so I remember telling him, like, well, we have to go to church, you know? I think I had went to Harvest, you know, and once, but it just, to me, I'm sorry, but it just wasn't for It didn't me. align. Yeah, it didn't mm-hmm. align for me. But when he did say, like, I told him, I was like, we got to go. Like, I went by myself to Mm -hmm. Harvest by myself. But the next time, I was like, we have to go somewhere together. We got to do this together. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and he was like, well, I saw the billboard and he told me about it's really close. by." So we we went. We went that Mm -hmm. next Sunday and, you know, we kept going, you know, and it really was the messages. It really Mm -hmm. turned into a healing space. Yes. You know, it really did. Just by the messages of what Pastor Matt was just what he would speak on like and there is some he would be harsh sometimes you know and i'll be like hey you know mm-hmm. <laughs> you know but like but and i it think w- it was the first time that we were able to experience because i'll be honest you know and and, and i hope I'll, i'm you know i'm gonna be honest you know it was the first time you know where you know there wasn't uh, a fear culture mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know because i think that a lot of people can probably relate to this especially um you know certain denominations they can create like a, a very radical um, culture where it it can turn into almost you know fear mm-hmm. a fear culture yeah. where if you leave you know God's not going to be with you mm-hmm. you know if you leave here everything is going to go wrong mm-hmm. you know if you leave here you know you're you're leaving the covering you mm-hmm. know and and that was really ingrained in me mm-hmm. you know that really was that culture was so ingrained in me 
that I really felt that that's why I didn't want anything to do with it because I said what's the point now mm -hmm. like I've left like um you know God God's probably just done with me now right. you know like I think I just have to face life you know face it as it comes and mm -hmm. you know and and just whatever happens I guess it's it happens you know but that fear culture yeah you know um a beautiful thing about your story is is the choice part you know i think that's part of spiritual deconstruction mm -hmm. is yeah. allowing people to choose to choose what works for them mm -hmm. you know um because when we're involved in religion we're told you know we're mm -hmm. told this is what you believe yeah you know and mm -hmm. there again little room for exploration yeah. you know so spiritual deconstruction or religious deconstruction is giving people back their ability to choose yeah mm -hmm. to choose what works for them what works for people may not work for me may not work for you know the next yeah. person but it doesn't mean that they're wrong mm -hmm. yeah you know it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that they're going to hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, you know, all yeah. of the things that we were told. It's yeah. just, it's their process. It's their process. It's their yeah, process. because we, it's, because it's so true. Like, that's one thing that I've learned is that our, all, each and every one of our journey is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why, like, I've, you know, I don't want to say, like, I, I stamp myself, you know, but I kind of, you know, I stand on, you know, I'm very unorthodox now. Like, mm -hmm. I'm very, very unorthodox. You know, I... I wear it, I live it, you know, like I, uh, you know, I, I, I rub people the wrong way mm -hmm. sometimes because of the, because of the way that I am, you know, because I do challenge, you know, mm -hmm. I do challenge, you know, certain things, you know, as to why, you know, like, you know, especially when it comes to, to people, mm -hmm. you know, because that's at the end of the day, like we're trying to help people, mm -hmm. you know, and I always, I always go back to history, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a history Mm -hmm. nerd a little bit but i love like martin luther mm -hmm. you know not martin luther king jr but martin luther mm -hmm. you know the, the the one who started basically the whole protestant movement mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. he's the one that opened that the door for that you know and i always people people always look at that story and they think that yeah you know he was this radical person that you know wanted to to change the catholic church you know but that's really not so like he just had a heart for people you know, Martin Luther had a heart for people. He was a priest and he couldn't get it out of his mind that, man, this scripture in Romans that we are saved by faith, mm -hmm. that we are saved by grace, you know, and that it's by faith. And so he was living in a religious system, you know, during that time, especially during that time where he loved the church, mm -hmm. you know, he loved God, you know, but they their value was based off what they could give mm -hmm. and based off what they could do it was a it was a religious organization it was a religious culture of works mm -hmm. works mm -hmm. you know if you're gonna if you and your loved ones are gonna be saved you gotta pay this much mm -hmm. you gotta do this much right. you gotta you know give to this give to that if you and your family you know which is unbiblical you know and when he discovered that his love for God and his love for people. Mm -hmm. He's like, man, because he saw the suffering in people. Mm -hmm. He saw what this this was doing to people, mm -hmm. you know, and he wrote the thesis and he went and he stamped it on the, you know, the front doors of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. you know, but it, wa it was it wasn't to, to challenge. It wasn't to start a division. He truly wanted them to turn turn to what was right mm -hmm. you know in the eyes of god and for the people mm -hmm. you know and you know story history so you know tells us you know he, they you know they didn't want to listen mm -hmm. they didn't want to they didn't want to admit that yeah maybe we are what we're doing is wrong mm -hmm. it before god and before people so what he was excommunicated mm -hmm. you know and i really believe that that is always a mark you know of like sometimes you know, we have to understand, we have to hear people when they're sharing their opinions, mm -hmm. you know, because there are times where people might share their opinion out of just a selfish motive, or maybe they do just want to, maybe they do just want to express themselves. harshly express themselves or har bring a harsh criticism, you know, but that's never a reflection of us. Mm -hmm. It's always a reflection of them. But we also have to be careful because there's people that might bring things that that want to state things that, you know, because it's maybe affecting them mm -hmm. in a personal level yeah. or it's, or they see how it's affecting others mm -hmm. in a, in a way. And so I think that 
as uh, you know people in the church as people in the church we have to be sensitive to that mm -hmm. you know especially if people are coming and maybe they're sharing their doubts mm -hmm. maybe they're sharing because i think that it's going to start with us mm -hmm. a lot you know mm -hmm. to create those safe spaces and then eventually you know facilitate these safe spaces so that people can you know um good examples like my my uncle recently lost his daughter mm -hmm. you know she lost she lost the battle to cancer you know and um i called him and and you know he's a you know he's a believer he's he's gone to church and you know he he believes and um you know but i was just like how, you know como esta tío? like how are you doing and he's like it's like honestly i just don't know mm -hmm. you know i just don't know like i don't know why and i just heard him and he's like i don't know why i don't know i i prayed and i prayed and i prayed and she's gone mm -hmm. and i don't know what to do i don't know why is god so harsh you know and my i just listened i just listened to my uncle i just let him express himself but the other side i could have been like no Mm -hmm. No, uncle. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Where is your faith? Mm -hmm. Where is this? Where is that? You know, because we're we're taught, like you said, mm -hmm. we're told this is what you got to mm -hmm. do. You know, regardless of your emotions, regardless, this is what you do. This mm -hmm. is how you behave. This is how you react, you know, as if we're a cookie cut culture, but we're not. Every individual is different. There's people that deal with loss and they're like, hey. You know, okay, you know, they lived a great life. Man, I, I, I enjoyed their company while they're here. But then there's people that are like, man, why? Mm -hmm. You know, and we need to be able to create those spaces for them. Yeah, we need to make it okay to ask God why. You know, I remember growing up that was like forbidden, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like you cannot question God. You cannot yeah. ask God why, but just trust you know, just trust that yeah. it's for a purpose, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and we we have to normalize it. We have to make it OK for people to question God. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's good. That's um, so good. And, yeah. And I just, you know, um, we're talking about inclusion here also in the church, you know, and, and you know, also acknowledging that like love is not just for some people mm -hmm. you know but that love is expanded to everyone mm -hmm. you know and that it's not just a certain group of people mm -hmm. that get to experience god love god's love you mm -hmm. know if that's where your faith is or mm -hmm. if that's what your faith is yeah. is in you know um you know but we we have to acknowledge that some of these ideologies have really caused some harm to mm -hmm. groups of people. Yeah. You know, specifically our queer folks, you know, and with there's queer folks within the church. Mm -hmm. We have to accept that. You know. Yeah. And are we making room for them? Yeah. You know, are we listening to their stories? Yeah. Are we um accepting them for who they are? Yeah. You know, we we really have to make that space within the church for yeah. them as well mm -hmm. you know because god's love is not limited to mm -hmm. a group of people yeah mm -hmm. you know it's for everyone yeah and it really yeah and on that subject of you know inclusion yeah i i agree with that so much because what i always believe and i always tell people is that when it comes to certain things like at the end of the day that relationship between you and God is personal, mm -hmm. you know, and wherever that, when you have that personal encounter, wherever he leads you, whatever areas he leads you to change, you know, that will be in, in between you and God mm -hmm. and his timing. Our job is to just love on people, mm -hmm. is to just love on in whatever condition they come in, whether they're, they come in addicted to certain things, whether they come in you know, committing, you know, these different acts of sins or whatever the case may be, because at the end of the day, we're a hospital, mm -hmm. you know, we're a hospital for, for broken individuals. We are broken individuals mm -hmm. and we have to be able to just love on them, mend them and just walk them through that process, whatever, however that process may look in their in personal life, mm -hmm. you know, but they have to come because it's like, I always look back at my own personal life. I didn't change because I was forced to change. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know i wasn't you know i changed because i came to a reckon mm -hmm. i that i realized man this is bringing destruction to my life mm -hmm. and 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 when i came face to face with god when i not face to face literally but when i had that reckoning that that awakening within my life it made me realize that you know what i no longer want to be this individual i no longer want to be this person and this is who i want to be i want mm -hmm. to i want to like my wife says i want to please you i want to have that relationship with you i want to get to know you because his love is what embraces us his love is what holds us you know and but sometimes these ideologies you know and that's why it's so cool that we we're kind of bringing the two worlds like psychology counseling mm -hmm. therapy but then also the deconstructing of mm -hmm. faith because they really do go hand in mm -hmm. hand because there's a lot of listeners out there that have maybe struggles in both but a lot of times like you said a lot of times our struggles our identity crisis mm -hmm. our um, brokenness could be led or could have you know started because of something because mm -hmm. of an institution because of a religious experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of you know maybe certain things that happen to us mm -hmm. you know even within the church mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah yeah and my wife can say like she's right like you've gotten rid of uh you could say she's kind of broken that generational trauma i guess you could say because right like your mom she was very close with her dad right yeah she was very close with him um he well he was closed he, yeah he was of um it was a dad that just wasn't he was there but wouldn't really have like conversations mm -hmm. with them you know yeah. very to himself you know so she kind of it was hard for her sometimes to i feel like she did what she can like of course like she did what she can but i feel like she could have she's she can be very harsh not harsh i don't want to say hard but very to herself too because she just I think from her mom, she had a good relationship with her mom, but she was one of the eldest mm. um, daughters because there's nine of them. So, you know, mm -hmm. like there was nine of them and yeah. she was like the, the fourth child. So she was like, how you said, like you as an eldest, you have to take the responsibility of taking care of those that are younger. Mm -hmm. And she took on that responsibility, you know, and so she was another mother in the mm -hmm. home, you know, so... Uh, she just didn't really learn how to express herself. Mm -hmm. I think us as her children, she learned with us, but she could only handle so much, mm -hmm. you know, because there is, you know, I think as growing up, I can think about like, I think even as an adult, sometimes, sometimes we'll have conversations. I'm like, why this? Like, why that? Like, if I get the chance to ask her, you know, and she's just like, I don't know why. I don't know why mm -hmm. I was like, you know, like, it's just the way we grew up. Mm -hmm. Like, that was, that's always like her thing. Like, just the way we grew up. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Like, even yeah. sometimes till this day, like the way she gets <laughs> when I see her get angry with my dad and they're fighting or not like, you know, like just, you know, just we yeah. all couples have it you know mm -hmm. <laughs> they've been the petty, married petty arguments yeah the, those petty <laughs> arguments they've been married for so long already like almost <laughs> almost 40 years so it's like i'm just like why do you get so angry with him you know and she's like i don't know like you know like and yeah. it's 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 but i think i've learned you know like okay i see what they've gone through because i think something that we've learned too as um listening to just you know coming to church listening to different messages you know i'm a very podcast person i love to hear podcasts so even things that i've listened to um just the behavioral it's not the behavioral curses that's something that i think christians use a lot mm -hmm. but it's the behavioral generational genera curses the genera yeah, they call them generational, generational, generational curses. curses no but the general generation behaviors yeah it's the patterns the patterns mm -hmm. of like one has learned and yeah you know and that's where we have to learn how to what to de deconstruct yeah you yeah. know so that we don't take on those things and we mm -hmm. do better you know yeah. or we at least see okay you know we really go through the process of all that like mm -hmm. what is it what is this the right way yeah. to to express ourselves you know or you know like going into deep of that right. you know? yeah and yeah. that's why i said like she's because her relationship with her dad is is great mm -hmm. you know she has a great relationship with her and that's why I said, like, she's really broken that mm -hmm. generational pattern, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's what we all need to really, really be encouraged to do, you know, is to. And I hope that this episode has encouraged people, you know, to do that, you know. And 
What are some last words of advice for someone that might be going through depression, anxiety, and is kind of just thinking about, should I make that, take that next step to seek therapy? What would you tell them? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, if you're struggling with your mental health, you know, I I want to encourage you, you know, and I, I, uh, I acknowledge you, you know, I acknowledge uh, your pain and I acknowledge the struggle and it's, it's not easy, you know, and um, the encouragement is really that you don't have to do it alone. You know, there is help. There are resources out there. Um, there are people who want to help you, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, you know, I just want to give you a little bit of hope. You know, sometimes in these really harsh, hard moments, uh, we kind of lose hope. But there, there is hope, you know. Um, this, you know, emotions are, are temporary, and this isn't to minimize anyone's experience. Um, but this, it doesn't have to be like this forever, you know. There yeah. are, there, there's help out there for you. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And, and I want to, you know, just encourage everyone to, you know, out there listening to us. If, you know, we're going to put uh, Tabitha's information, you know, there in the, the description. And if you're in this area, you know, in the Inland Empire, near the Beaumont area, San Bernardino area, and you're looking, you know, for, for, for help, you're looking for counseling, you're looking for a safe space to even deconstruct your faith. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you find yourself not knowing what you believe anymore. Um, you know, I want to just encourage you, you know, that first of all, God's, God loves you. You know, man's behavior is never a reflection of who he is. Man's behavior is always a reflection of who they are and things that maybe they're still processing and going through. But I want to let you know that God loves you for who you are, regardless of where you're at. He loves you. And I want you to know that. And I want you to know that there are people, there are spaces, there are places that are safe for you, where you can go, where you can deconstruct, where you can question whatever it is that you need to question in this moment of your life, because it's not over. You know, I love what Tabitha just said. It's there's hope. There's hope for you. And so we want to connect you. So if that's you, wherever you find yourself, you know, send us a message. Um, Like I said, her information is going to be on there. Connect with her directly. I know she offers... um, free 15 minute consultations, right? Yeah. And I just want to clarify that, um, though my business is located in Beaumont, um, I only do online individual Ooh, therapy. So this expands to people all across California. There you um, go. my license only allows me to work with people in California. Okay. Um, but anywhere in California, um, yes, you could reach out to me. That's even better. Yeah. That's even it expands better. Guys. The resources. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the beautiful thing about the internet. So that there's no excuse anymore. There really isn't, you know, and And from experience, therapy really is the way to go. You know, it really is. You know, um, it's it's a decision that I do not regret. I don't regret it. You know, it's something that I don't regret the the time invested in it, even the money invested in it. You know, I don't regret it. You know, and I recommend it to anyone who's on this journey to get better, you know. And um, so send us a message. Share this video with someone. Um, continue to hit the alert button. You know, we're shooting content out, you know, a lot more uh, steadily. You know what I mean? So, you know, make sure to follow us on Instagram, uh, TikTok. We're even on TikTok, guys. You know, follow us on there. You know, we'd love to connect with you guys. If you have an offbeat story and you say, man, I want to share, you know, send us a message. Let's link up. Let's talk about it. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you, Tabitha. My lovely wife, Jeanette, thank you for co-hosting with me. And uh, so see you guys next time. This was Off Beat Podcast. Let's go. Let's go.